So it's not only heritage values that vary over time, but the terms used to describe and frame the discourse around them. And this afternoon, I want to reflect on two key terms, uh, place and landscape. Look at how I think they draw heritage discourse in different directions and suggest that they're complementary in the creation of more inclusive heritage values. But I'd also like to suggest that there's a current sort of focus on the concept of place, which is perhaps leading to a, a lack of balance in this discussion. So my talk is also, in a sense, a plea for landscape. The dominance of place thinking in the heritage sector spans the last 20 years at least, um, since the document Power of Place from 2000, which states that for most people the historic environment represents the place in which they live. Um, it's currently seen in various initiatives, Historic England's 100 Places, also in the recent DCMS Heritage Statement that talks about heritage creating great places, and current interest more generally in the sector in concepts of placemaking and place branding. And within this, um, as has already been mentioned, there's been a particular focus on places connected to minority heritage, um, in minority groups including disability heritage, LGBTQ heritage, ethnic minority heritage um, in the current Another England project. Um, the first thing to say is that all this is extremely worthy and welcome, um, and it redresses a sort of lack of interest in, in these aspects of heritage in the past. But I also want to add a but. Um, place is one particular way of representing and promoting heritage, but there are others which in some ways may be more inclusive. And in particular, I'd like to suggest the, the concept of landscape um, may be a better way of exploring the deep time of prehistory um, and history, which can provide um, a counterpoint, a balance to the identity heritage associated with historic places. So I just want to spend a little bit of time looking at what we mean when we talk about place. It's one of those terms that has long been of interest to geographers and philosophers. Um, historic England defines it um, at the bottom there um, as any part of the historic environment of any scale that has a distinctive identity perceived by people. So here the key elements seem to be distinctiveness, identity, perception. Scholars outside heritage have added other qualities to this understanding of place, including components like movement and action or practice, relationality, um, sites where social relations within and beyond place join up, um, materiality, power and meaning. Um, and some of you may remember archaeological debates um, two or three decades ago where place considered as subjective and meaningful was routinely contrasted with space, which was objective and quantitative. Um, and that discourse followed the work of geographers like Tuan, um, who saw place very much as humanised space. Other authors have tried to break the concept down. Um, the geographer Tim Cresswell identified three key components of place, location, locale and sense of place, and defined what we find in place as a combination of materiality, meaning and practice. Um, but precise definitions are elusive, as you might expect, reflecting the philosopher Jeff Malkus's assertion that the notion is not at all clearly defined, and for Cresswell similarly place is a word wrapped in common sense, um, so that beyond the simple definitions, there is considerable debate about the nature of place, and that's why you can find all these books written on the, <laughs> on the word. <laughs> For example, Malpass has critiqued the idea that place is a, a matter of human response to physical surroundings, rather that it is integral to the very structure and possibility of experience. In other words, Place can't be a social construction if the social doesn't exist prior to place. And it, it is within the structure of place, he states, that the very possibility of the social arises. Um, this appears somewhat similar, perhaps, to the ideas of Tim Ingold, who may be a more familiar name um, for those of us working in archaeology, whose explanation of the dwelling perspective sees meaning as imminent in the relational contexts of people's practical engagement with their lived-in environments. 
We can also add something, I think, to the concept of identity as set out in the definition of place here. It's not just that people perceive places to have identity, but also that places are critical to people's identities because they form the scenes of everyday social interactions. So arguably, the heritage definition of place as being about perceived distinctiveness and identity doesn't capture the full conceptual range of the idea. Um, and if we omit this relational component identified in the academic literature, it seems to neglect connections between places by focusing primarily on what makes individual places distinctive. And by leaving out the component of action or practice, it may fail to get to grips with the contested nature of many historic places. I think this matters because if we reduce place and effect to locality, it's always defining a given place against other ones. Um, and by focusing just on distinctiveness, we privilege what is unique over what's shared. So rather than attending to the relational qualities of places, we address the heritage values by looking for the character of a particular place, what makes it unique and therefore different from other places, local places for local people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in, perhaps in, in doing so, I suggest we lose the equally important focus on what places share, how they influence one another, and what is perhaps the fundamental social question of our time, how the local is connected to the global. This can also to some extent lead to atomized heritage, as Linda's uh, session abstract puts it, since all heritage is someone's, it potentially excludes someone else. We do need to pr promote minority heritage because it's so often been excluded by the mainstream, but that shouldn't be the end of the process. And just as defining place shouldn't just focus on difference, we shouldn't simply define heritage of one group against that of another without also attending to aspects of heritage that are shared, global, and held in common. There's a parallel problem, it seems to me, which is the current media preoccupation with genetics and descent, whether it's our family trees or our broader sort of ethnic heritage background. When people talk about their heritage these days, they often mean their genetic ancestors and the places those people came from. Um, you can go on ancestry and buy a DNA test for Christmas. It may be too late for delivery now. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I suggest there's another type of inheritance, um, not just what's in our genes, but what's under our feet and in our senses. <clears throat> the land we inhabit, the landscapes shaped by millennia of human activity. So I suggest that we can balance the identity heritage of place through the broad connections and deep time associated with the landscape. Um, and there's just a, as big a literature here as there is a, on place, of course. It's tempting simply to gloss landscape as the setting of places or as an array of places. Um, but of course, it's more complex than that. And place and landscape don't have a scalar relationship. Um, the geographer Edward Ralph has succinctly stated that landscape is both the context for places and an attribute of places. Um, for Malpass, again, landscape is a representation of place, and as such, it is the representation of a relatedness to place, a representation of a mode of emplacement. Um, and if you're wondering why the, the opening slide showed Robert Smithson's spiral jetty, um, it wasn't only because it's a very nice image, but also because I think land art, self-consciously emplaced in landscape, seems above all to encapsulate the nature of this relationship between <coughs> landscape and place. So they are intimately related terms, but I suggest they do differ in the way, in the direction they, they take us. Place, I suggest, draws us inwards to our interactions with one another through ideas of identity, distinctiveness, and status, sense of place, knowing your place. But as Edward Casey states, place is broadened in landscape. Landscape um, is defined in the European Landscape Convention as an area as perceived by people whose character is the result of the action and interaction of natural and or human factors. So here are perception and people again, but character rather than distinctiveness, and I suggest importantly the notions of action and of nature in addition. The concept of landscape reaches outwards into ideas of nature, character, environment and ecosystem, 
and speaks to our relationship to the world. So although landscape emerges from the interaction of the, <coughs> the cultural and the natural, um, the term has, of course, frequently been critiqued because of its aesthetic connotations, um, which geographers like Dennis Cosgrove um, have previously shown often may serve to veil social inequalities behind the beauty of nature. Um, and we can think of recent examples, um, a speech by the Environment Secretary at the Conservative Party conference, where he referred to conservatives as instinctive defenders of beauty in the landscape, protectors of wildlife, friends of the earth. Now, whatever one thinks of the truth of that <laughs> statement, it's clear that politicians like to use these terms because they have resonance. So we do need to, to attend to them. What landscape also shows, um, as, or what this use of landscape also shows, as Graham Fairclough has noted, is that landscape policy still reflects this emphasis on natural beauty and the idea about historic landscapes being designed and ornamental. So we need to get beyond this uh, um, idea that landscape is just about the picturesque. Um, we need an emphasis on everyday landscapes and other modes of perception. I think this shows that landscape is, is just as problematic a term as place and equally subject to critique and, and analysis. Um, as with place, many writers have emphasised the inherent ambiguity and complexity of the term, um, and that's seen both as a problem and a, a virtue. For example, um, Tim Cresswell wrote that he prefers place to landscape because landscape's too much about what's already been accomplished and not enough about the processes of everyday life. Too much history, perhaps. Um, Chris Tilley has recently written, on the other hand, that the diversity of approaches and perspectives is precisely that which makes the study of landscape so interesting and valuable. I think landscape offers two main correctives to the place-based discussion. Firstly, it's an interdisciplinary term used across the environmental disciplines, and perhaps therefore we can use it to find common ground when we're dealing with natural environment partners, and they're sometimes, to us on the heritage side at least, rather off-putting terminology of ecosystem services and natural <coughs> capital. A discourse which tends to reduce the historic component of the environment to a, an epiphenomenon, a cultural service, um, linked to a sense of place. Secondly, landscape is fundamentally palimpsest. It's not that it's about large spatial scales, it's not necessarily scalar, but deep temporal ones, as Tim Ingold noted in his groundbreaking analysis of Bruegel's harvesters um, in his discussion of the temporality of the landscape. So whereas the, the temporality of place often seems to be about daily processes, the temporality of the landscape is something deeper. Fairclough notes that landscape explicitly contains the past as well as the present. We don't usually talk, for example, about a Bronze Age place, but we do understand a Bronze Age landscape. And we can trace this aspect of landscape back in different directions to the historical empirical approach of Hoskins, the poetic imaginative writing of Jaquetta Hawkes in a land which seeks to evoke the image of an entity, the land of Britain in which past and present, nature, man and art appear all in one place. And I think that the debate about heritage values has frequently overlooked the deep time of the landscape that goes beyond the potentially alienating or conflict, conflicted heritage places um, to the hill forts, barrows and stone tools of our deep ancestors. And I think these are the heritage of anyone living in, in Britain today, whenever our forebears may have arrived. There's no point looking for genetic descent. The legacy of deep prehistory is the landscape <laughs> connected to all of us um, and the people whose traces we seek are the, the forerunners on our common human journey. So this I think is inclusive heritage if only it's recognised as such rather than um, being seen as something um, difficult, distant, of academic interest only. So I think counterbalancing the emphasis on the identity heritage of specific places, important though that is, requires attention to the shared elements of landscape and deep time, reclaiming landscape in heritage discourse beyond specific methodologies such as historic landscape characterisation, 
depends not only on, on championing the European Landscape Convention and the definitions set out there, but also showing how landscape is shared heritage regardless of our genes and our localities. Um, we also need to decouple the human story from the current emphasis on genetic descent and see it as something held in common. Prehistory is not the, the teleological prelude to a stereotypical rural Britain, but it's a past world in its own right, different enough that we can learn from it, similar enough that we can empathise with it. So to conclude, both landscape and place have a complex range of meanings and associations, but that does not mean they're vague or trite. I suggest that the relationship between place and landscape, configured through an understanding of temporality, um, really consists of nothing less than our being in the world. Um, we need both elements in heritage discourse, identity and environment. Landscape viewed through the prism of place becomes more embodied and internalised than the external gaze, the aesthetic sense with which it's traditionally associated. But place viewed through the prism of landscape provides a sense of connectivity that perhaps counterbalances the sometimes problematic emphasis on local distinctiveness. And it's from articulating this relationship that understanding of the values of the historic environment emerge in landscape and place, character and significance. Thank you.